Hello, welcome to another coding challenge with me, Dan. I don't know. Maybe you know my name, maybe you don't. I'm here to program this particular simulation from scratch. So what this is, is kind of like an infinite procedurally generated terrain. It looks like you're flying over it. So I'm gonna use the processing programming environment. It's a Java-based environment. You can get it at processing.org. Check the links for various things you might need in the description of this video. But without further ado, <laughs> I'm gonna get right, to, I'm gonna get started. Okay, so I'm gonna close this out. So what do I need? Um, so first of all, I have a sketch set up. I've got setup and I've got draw, a size and background. That's the only thing. So I've got this blank canvas right now. And notice in setup, I'm also using P3D because I need a 3D environment. So what I need before I can really do anything is I need to make the terrain itself as just like a flat grid. So how does that work? Basically, um, I could draw a giant rectangle, and that would be my terrain. But instead of drawing a giant rectangle, what I want to draw is a lot of tiny rectangles next to each other. And I, I'm saying rectangle, and I guess I really mean square, like this. Because I want my terrain to be lots and lots of shapes all attached to each other and next to each other. And in fact, a good way to do this in 3D is to use something called a triangle strip. Triangle strip, you know. What this means is I can say vertex, 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 over and over again. And what the computer is gonna do is connect all these vertices with triangles, triangular polygons. And all connected together, you'll see this appearance of a mesh. And then what I'm going to do is once I have this mesh, is I'm gonna take each point as this were my screen, right? This flat whiteboard is my screen screen, I'm going to extrude some of them, pull them out. Some of them are going to get pulled higher, some of them are going to get pulled lower, so it has a mountainous-like quality. So before I can get that part though, I just need this triangular mesh to appear in the window. So let's first make that happen. So the way to make that happen is I need to have a nested loop, right, for every single point on this grid. So I'm going to start with x equals zero, x X is less than, and I'm going to need to have know how many columns and how many rows. So I'm going to say X is less than columns. And then I'm going to say Y equals zero, Y is less than rows. Okay, so now columns and rows don't exist as variables. So I'm going to add them, columns, rows. And what I'm going to do is also, I need to figure out, a good variable that I'm going to need is how big is each of these squares? How many pixels wide? How many pixels high? And it'll be the same number. Let's make that 20. So I'm going to add another variable. I've got this timer going. I've been doing this for two months. See how long this takes. So hopefully not more than 30 minutes. I'm going to make a variable called SCL, kind of standing for scale. And uh, I'm going to set that equal to 20. And I'm really keeping an eye on my audio to make sure the audio doesn't cut out. Okay. Uh, okay. So now, what am I doing? Okay, so first, just to make sure things are working, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, have some sort of arbitrary width and height. Uh, and I'm going to make those the same as the window, just for now. It's going to change later, but I'm just sort of being simple about things. And then I'm going to, the, the number of columns is the width of, the, uh, width of my grid divided by that scale, and the number of rows is the height of my grid divided by that scale. And just to make sure things are working, let's just draw a rectangle. A rectangle at where? X times scale, Y times scale, and at that size. And I'm going to say stroke 255 and no fill. So what I should have so far, if things are working right, is a, the, a, a perfect grid. So this is a good sign. I now have this grid, but I can't draw it as rectangles. to. Yeah, I could, but to manipulate it, to make it a terrain, to make it all bumpy, I want these to be triangles, a triangle strip. So I'm going to change what I'm doing, and I'm going to say, now let's think about this. Hmm, my triangle strip, now I could have my triangles go down, but mentally it's just easier for me to think of everything as rows. So I want to do the top row, next row, next row, next row, next row, next row of triangles. So I need the outer loop to be Y, because First start with Y, do all the X's. Go to the next Y, do all the X's. So I, I realize I want to take this Y rows and, and put this as the outer loop. And then what I need to do is for every, each row will be its own triangle strip. So by the way, where is this coming from? Uh, I'm going to go to uh, processing.org under uh, reference. 
and under um, begin shape. And, I know, uh, and I'm going to zoom in here. See, So what I'm doing is I'm using begin shape and end shape, which allows you to set a bunch of vertices and you get a shape. But if I scroll down, this is really what I want. I want this triangle strip. So I want to send a, set, set a whole bunch of vertices and have it all connected magically with triangles. Okay. So now I should be able to, if I go back to the code, uh, say uh, for every single row, begin shape and then end shape. And ah, of course, I don't want to just say generic begin shape. I want to say begin shape. And what I'm intending to make is a triangle strip. And then instead of making rectangles, what I need, what I, what I, what I want to do is just set. And I'm gonna. Uh, Set this up here, the stroke and fill outside, just to, instead of drawing rectangles, what I want to do is set vertices. So the first vert vertex is going to be at x times scale, y times scale, and it's going across. So if I were to just run this right now, I should, I'm just getting these lines across, because I didn't actually make <laughs> the triangles. What I need to do is create the vertices like this. What I just did was set vertices like this. Vertex, 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 vertex. I need to do vert up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. So I need to do y and y plus 1 for each loop. Uh, so how do I do that? Uh, I just All I need to do is add another vertex. y plus 1 times scale. There we go. This should work. Please work. There we go. So now you can see I have this beautiful mesh of triangles. So this is the building block from which I can that I can manipulate. Now, it doesn't look very 3D. I've done everything in 2D right now. So let's at least take a moment to rotate it on an axis. So if I if I right now you're seeing <laughs> where's a prop? You're see, this is my Kleenex. <laughs> you're seeing this and it's just flat facing you. I want to rotate it like this so it looks like you're flying over it. So to do that, we want to rotate along what axis? This is the x-axis. I want to rotate along this x-axis. So I'm going to say right here, rotate x and like pi divided by 3, which is like 180, 60 degrees. So if I run this, where did it go? So we've got some problems here. The issue is I've drawn everything relative to the top left. So if everything's drawn relative to the top left, everything is rotating around the top left, and I've just rotated it completely out of view. So what I need to do is have everything drawn relative to the center of the window. So I should translate to the center. Ah, look, there it is. And I can see it now. I can see this plane that I might be traveling over. But it's shifted off into the right. It's because 0, 0 is in the center, which is what I want. But the triangles start at 0, 0. So remember I have this variable. And this should I'm going to make these global variables. Uh, w and H. I, I want every single triangle to be like offset back by that width divided by 2. So if I go back to here, I can. I wonder if I, I could probably actually just do a whole nother translation. Let's just do another translation of negative width after I rotate, width divided by 2, negative height divided by 2. I think that will do the trick. And there we go. So this is what I want. I now have this almost infinite, it's not infinite, but I have this terrain of triangles that is on an angle map. Well, look at this. I'm only at eight minutes. This could possibly be done in 12. I should never say how long this is going to take because it's only going to take longer. But we're doing really well now. What is, what do I need to do here? Well, I've really gotten super far. The only thing I need to do is take each one of those and like pull some of the vertice, ver, vertices up. So let's just do something goofy. Like let's make all of them random. So how do I pull them up? Well, each vertex only has an X and a Y, right? Remember, this is, this is the mesh that I'm drawing. It's exactly this, but just turns on its side. But if I want to take this point and pull it up a little bit, so when it's turned on its side, it looks like it's going up along the y-axis. It's really changing the z, the z value. The z value for all of those vertices has been 0 all along. So let's go now and say, what if I were to do like random negative 100, 100 for all the z values? <laughs> What's going to happen here? Let's run this and see. Look at that. Okay, well, one, I can see it's kind of going crazy. Let's, 100, I guess, was too much. Let's make it ramp between negative 10 and 10. Let's run it again. There, you can see that I now have this mesh. And, I, you know, maybe I'll make the frame rate 
rate one, so you can kind of like just sort of catch it for a second. Is it running? Yeah. Oops, that didn't happen. Hey, is frame rate broken in, uh, ooh, look at that. I wonder if frame rate is broken in um, P3D. That's really weird. I don't know why that's not working. I'm gonna have to investigate that and might maybe file a bug report. Um, so, but anyway, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. The point of what you're seeing is this now has this quality of a terrain because each point is higher or lower. Now the issue is I need to have some consistent way of doing this. So I think what would be useful is for me to have a data structure that stores all the Z values, right? The, um, the X and Y values, the X and Y values, ah, <laughs> the light is, I knocked over a light. The X and Y values, and I'm probably gonna have everything messed up now. The X and Y values, physical comedy, or that's not really comedy, just physical mishap. The X and Y values are fixed. They're never going to change. The Z values, however, might change. There's some sort of variable calculated procedural. Some algorithm has to generate those Z values. So I need another data structure to keep track of all those Z values. And what I think I would like to do is use a two-dimensional array. A two-dimensional array would allow me to store for every single uh, spot here some Z value calculated according to some, to some algorithm. So let's go back. And I'm going to come back to here. And I'm going to say, uh, and I'm going to make these floating point values. So this is a two dimension. This is how I in in Java in processing how I define a two dimensional array. And I'm going to call it I don't know what to call it uh, landscape uh, uh, terrain. I'll call it terrain. <laughs> is a new uh, and you know what I I need the two dimensional array to have the, have the number of spots as the number of column and rows. So I want to actually initialize it after I calculate the columns and rows. And so a two-dimensional array with this many columns and this many rows. Now, what can I do? But I can actually, in setup right now, I could just say i equals, uh, uh, I'll use x again, x, and you know what, I just need this exact, sorry, same nested loop. And instead of drawing anything, what I'm doing here is I'm saying uh, terrain index x index y equals some random value. There we go. So now I'm picking a random set of values in setup. And then here, instead of drawing them as random, I'm going to say, get those Z values. I want the Z value at X, Y. And then what do I want here? I want the Z value at X, Y plus 1. Remember, I'm doing vertex, 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 vertex. So I need those Z values at Y and Y plus 1. So now if I run this, we should see, uh, whoops, I got an error. Array out of bounds exception. Oh, okay, so of course I got an array out of bounds exception because I'm doing every single row and the row below it. And when I get to the bottom, there's no row below it. So I need to say rows minus one for this loop. I can only go to the second to last row. So now if I run this again, we should have, there we go. So now you can see I've got the terrain. And it doesn't, it, you can see that it's not like a terrain that's filling my view, but that's sort of an easy problem to solve because, you know, I have, that's why I have these variables here. I can say, well, let's just make it much wider and much longer. And now I have my terrain filling my view. So how do I make it look though like I'm flying over it and have it appear infinite? Tricky question. Well, here's a way to do it. <laughs> There's a bunch of different strategies and maybe I'll make another video that picks up right from here to do different ways. But I'm gonna use something, you can see this random terrain is not so great. Like it doesn't really look very much like a mountainous-like quality. What I want is something that's more organic, fractal-like, nature-like, so to speak. And what I could do is use something called Perlin noise. So let's, I have a separate video, which I think I go over Perlin noise that I'll link to. But I'm gonna just briefly discuss what I, how Perlin noise would work in this context. And I am, I don't know what time I'm at, but I'm gonna keep going. Okay, so Perlin noise. Perlin noise is a way of getting smooth random numbers. Meaning, random numbers, if I think of random numbers in one dimension, random numbers that I might ask for over time that are similar to the one I picked before it. So if I want to get kind of a whole, if I wanted to move something around the screen kind of fluidly, uh, I could use Perlin noise to pick its location. But, what I want to do is actually use two-dimensional Perlin noise, meaning think of a space of numbers in two dimensions. 
So if I have a checkerboard and I were just to pick a random number between 0 and 10, or between negative and 10 for every spot on the checkerboard, I would get exactly this. Every single spot on this board is a random terrain value, but that's not what I want. What I want is to pick a z value for here, and then I want all the values around it to be somewhat similar to it. And then for this one, I want all the values around it to be somewhat similar to it. So as things move up and down, they move up and down smoothly. So I think this probably merits a longer discussion about Perlin noise. I'll refer you to my other video and ask questions in the comments, and maybe I'll make one that demonstrates this more specifically. Uh, uh, maybe a video sort of just about this idea, but I'm going to kind of move on from that, that being the sort of conceptual idea. Now, how does it work? If I call the noise function in processing, there is a noise function in processing. Noise, the word noise really means randomness, like audio noise. But uh, random in processing means randomness. Noise means Perlin noise, named for Ken Perlin, who invented this particular algorithm. Now, Noise, if I give it to noise, whenever I call the noise, behind the scenes, when you start processing, it's almost as if this infinite plane of numbers was created in two dimensions with noise values available to you. Um, and you can give it any particular x, y value and get a particular noise value. And this function will always give you a value between 0 and 1. So actually, something that I can just do right now, it's going to look a little bit weird, is I can just go in here. And I can say, uh, here, instead of using random, what I want to do is use the noise function and just give me a noise value for every x and y. And then I also want to map the noise value, which goes between 0 and 1, to some value between like negative 100 and 100. So let's run this now and see what I get. So this is starting to look a little bit better. And you know, I could. I'm going to just make it a little less tall. This is starting to look a little bit better. Maybe there is a slight more consistency to this, but it's still pretty random. And the reason why it's still pretty random is that the numbers that I picked, right, I'm asking for noise at 0, 0, and then I'm asking for noise at 1, 0, then noise at 2, 0. You know, down here, I'm asking for noise at 2, 1. I'm, I'm making a big leap into the noise space with these whole integer numbers. And actually, the noise algorithm wants you to use small gradations. So the actual pixel x, y values doesn't really work very well for, to, to, act, to be the values that are passed into the noise function. So the way I'm going to do that instead is by creating my own variable. I'm going to say x offset as a float starting at 0. And that should actually go in here. And I'm going to say y offset as a float starting at 0, x offset, y offset. And then I'm going to use those values for the noise function as the things are going to pass through. And then I don't have to live with the x is 0 plus 1 plus 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 1. I can increment those separately. So here I can say something like x offset plus equals 0 .0, 0 0.01. And uh, that's what I want to do inside this loop. And then after that loop for every y, I want to increase that by 0 0.01. So we can see now that my values, whoa. So whoops, uh, camera went off. Um, you can see now that my noise is much too smooth. I move, I'm moving so slowly, my gradations within the noise space are so small that the actual terrain is very, very flat. So let's change that to like 0.1 and 0.1 and see how that does. Much better. You can start to see I have this sort of smooth, smooth mountainous region now. Oh, we're really getting something. This is much better. Um, and maybe I can increase this now to sort of make some of the mountains a little bit higher. You can see, ooh, that's pretty good too. And I could also even go through it faster and maybe shrink this down to 100. You know, I, I, I have a, a, a problem where I tend to play with like values forever. But you can, start, you can see now that we're getting something much more like actual terrain because I have these smooth random values. So now I've got this terrain that appears somewhat infinite, like I'm flying over it, but I'm not moving over it. Well, here's the kind of amazing thing. So I could start going down the road of like camera work and translation and then like adding to the end of it as I'm flying over it. But with Perl and Noise, there's a really, really quick trick that I can do. Let's think about how this might work. Right? Remember, this is my flat terrain and I have the noise values. So the noise values are getting picked based on, um, based on uh, x off, which are the values along that x-axis 
and y off, which are the values along the x-axis. What if my x offset values never change? What, I'm, I want to fly this way, right? I want to fly over it. I want to fly along the y-axis. y off always starts at 0. What if where y starts just changed a little bit each time? So that the top, the, what I'm seeing far off in the distance starts to appear as if it's moving close. So nothing's actually moving. I'm just adjusting the noise. I'm moving the noise space along where I'm starting in the, that, that two-dimensional plane of noise. So if I come back here, now I've got to recalculate this in draw. So I've got to take this whole loop in draw, and I'll just put it at the beginning. And I'm going to run it. So it looks the same. Now all I need to do is say, OK, this value needs to change, not start at 0 every single time. So I need another. Uh, I'm going to create a variable called flying. And it's going to be 0. And I'm going to have y offset start at flying. And in every cycle through draw, flying is going to increase a little bit. Oh, I'm flying backwards. So let's have flying decrease a little bit. <laughs> and now I'm flying forwards. Although it almost doesn't look like I'm flying. It looks just like it's undulating. But I, I would, I'm pretty sure if I make this a lot faster, it's going to appear much more like I'm flying. So you can see there's some goofiness happening in the background. It's kind of a nice effect. I probably, if I extended how much I'm drawing further out, uh, for example, if I made this like 1,600 and uh, you know, I could also think about uh, translating a little bit down so that it's a little bit lower. I think plus 50 would do that. Um, you know, I need to make it wider if I'm extending it further out. <laughs> I've got to stop tinkering with this. I'll let you tinker, this with, tinker, <laughs> tinker, tinker with this yourself. But um, changing the, the, you can sort of see now <laughs> that it's almost as if I, there's a curved world and the mountains are like pump appearing over. So I think if you play with the values, the play, play with the positioning, play with the rotation, you can, and also of course play with the color. Um, you don't have to draw this as a mesh. You can do a variety of things with this. So I'm hoping this helps you understand a little bit A about how 3D works and 3D shapes works, a little bit more about Perlin noise and also just sort of some creative exploration for what you might be able to do with this and what types of projects you might be able to make. So thanks for, I was just checking to see if the audio is still working and I had a panic moment where it wasn't. But thank you for watching. This was about 22 minutes and I think I made this example in 22 minutes, which I'm very pleased about. Okay, and I'll see you soon. Um, talk to you later. Bye-bye.